Clearwater Beach is a wonderful place, but you know it was more wonderfuler when I was growing up here in the 40s. I can't imagine a better place for any little boy to grow up, but especially for me. It was a lot different then than it is now. Uh, anybody here in the 50s? Anybody on Clearwater Beach in the 50s? Okay. Changed a lot since then, hadn't it? Amen. Amen. <laughs> For example, I'm looking out over here at Island Estates. That was all mangroves. <laughs> there was no construction on it at all when I, was, when I was growing up here. Mandalay Road, you could ride your bike down without any concerns or worries. Um, this area between here and Acacia Street was, uh, there were a couple of apartments. They look like motor courts, you know, with a, with a road that ran around the front and the houses sitting around the back in a U-shape. There were two of those, I think, right here, right? And some stores right on the corner of Baymont. Uh, of course, the chapel by the sea wasn't there. Um, the Palm Pavilion. Baymont was one of the keys. This was the street where the old wooden causeway came in. It came across through Island Estates and, uh, and came across. Some of the pictures in the book, I think, still have some of the pilings from the old wooden causeway that came before the Memorial Causeway was built. But for a little boy, it was absolutely magnificent. I put on a bathing suit. It's the first day I got out of school. And I did change clothes to go to church. But other than that, I wore a bathing suit all day long, every day, got wet several times. I slept in it at night. Um, it dried off, well, all the times that it got wet, which was many multiple times during the day. Mother kept checking my back to make sure I wasn't growing fins. Hence the name of the book, Growing Up Wet. Um, which is what I did. She also said that I lived on, in, on, and under the water. But there were a group of kids. We went to the um, South Ward Elementary School and went back and forth on a school bus across the causeway. So while we were coming home from school, we had time to plan the afternoon's activity. And we did all sorts of things and had, had lots and lots of fun playing together. Most of it related to the water. We came off the, um, we learned to swim, of course. We were border, borderline fish in swimming, but we got a cast net, we threw a cast net. When dad came home from the war, uh, he said, let's go buy a rowboat. And I forgot to finish eating my lunch, which was a very unusual phenomena at that point, and went right with him down to the docks to buy a, to buy a rowboat. He said it was for him to fish, but he quickly discovered that he could fish easier from the bridges and that he didn't need to, need to have a rowboat. So the rowboat became mine. And it was a good education for me. Um, the first day we were rowing, it was down the other side where the big marina is now. And we were rowing it back to the cove just to our left over here. And um, I was, he was teaching me how to row. Well, the oar locks weren't fastened in. And we lost one, and it's hard to row with one oar. You really need, you really need, yeah, you go in circles if you do that. So we had to establish a fun after we, several of the oar locks went swimming. We finally figured out how to tie them in, and we had to establish a fun for uh, replacement oar locks. But we took the boat around to the, uh, to the gulf in the in some, summertime and dove off of it and swam around it there. We didn't have an outboard motor, of course, and some friends loaned us an outboard motor. We very quickly learned that you don't go f farther away from your home place than you want to row back or swim pulling it in the water. So we, got, we learned, learned a lot of things about that. I would like to, to read you a little bit about my experience of learning to sail. The war was over and the Clearwater Snipe Fleet was actually in the old fish house, which is right here where we are, where we are now, the old tin fish house. Um, and we were, um, the Snipe Fleet had been put up during the war. You didn't want sails because that white would stand out and if there was a 
enemy off the coast. I never believed there were any submarines. There was rumors of submarines off the coast uh, here, but I realized that the bay, the Gulf was way too shallow for them to get in close to shore. They were off Miami where they could duck down into the Gulf Stream. But anyway, we had a lot of time talking. It was good, it was good conversation, a conversation piece. But um, we, they didn't use sails during the war. They didn't sail, sail the boats much. So they, time to put them out. And I was a roamer around the beach. One of my favorite haunts was the Yacht Club. I'd made friends with the guys there. And I came down to the dock one Sunday afternoon in February of 46. And uh, that day started in an ordinary manner, Sunday school and church, dinner. But the afternoon was anything but ordinary. As I rode my bicycle down by the old fish house, I noticed something unusual going on. They were rolling sleek sailboats out of the Big Ten shed. I'd brush past them every time I'd gone in the shed, but I'd never noticed these racing snipes with gleaming paint, slender masts, shining stainless steel fittings, and bright white sails. They rolled them to the end of the dock and with a hoist and sling, lifted them from trailers and lowered them carefully down to the water where they bobbed lightly like gulls floating easily on the swells. The wind, okay. the wind whipped the water and covered the bay with white caps. The sails flogged back and forth ferociously, making a loud, disconcerting clatter. I was trying to take it all in, looking ten places at once, my mind in heavy overload. When I heard a man call, Hey kid, you want to go sailing? I was startled. Was he talking to me? That was hard to believe. I looked around looking for another kid, but I was the only kid in the area, so I figured he meant me. Me? Go sailing? What might that be like? Might it be scary? Do I need to get permission? Do I have time to get it? In less than a second, I processed all these questions and a dozen more and answered enthusiastically, sure. Our boat was to do a trial sail, test the conditions, determine whether or not it was too windy to race. The skipper and crew of our boat, note how quickly I claimed ownership, were small men and lightweight. They wanted a third crew as movable ballast to help keep the boat upright. I was just the 70 pounds they needed. I scampered down the ladder and stepped cautiously on the deck. The man who had called me said, I'm Jimmy, this is George. All you have to do is sit on the side between us and lean out to help keep the boat level. That sounded easy enough. I thought, I can do that. The noise of the sail flapping violently was a little unnerving as I sat on the deck, my feet sticking down in the small opening, not quite reaching the floorboards. My heart was pumping as they finished the last preparations to get underway. George untied the line from the dock and pushed us off. The two of them each pulled on the lines attached to the sails. The sails quit flapping, filled with wind, and the boat surged forward. I was astounded. It felt different from anything I had ever known. I had no idea a boat would take off like this, driven only by the wind. I held on tight. As we headed out across the bay, the water rushed past. Jimmy sh shifted around a bit to get settled, and I checked to see if I was supposed to do anything. Jimmy said, let's harden up. I had no idea what that meant. He and George each pulled in on the sails. Now the wind affected us differently and we began to tip in the strong wind gusts. All three of us pushed to the edge of the deck and leaned out, trying to balance the force of the wind. A wave hit the front of the boat and the spray flew. I automatically ducked behind George, which protected me some, but there were more waves and more spray. Before it was over, we were all drenched. In stronger gusts, the boat leaned more, and we stretched out further and pushed out over the side. One particularly strong gust tipped us way over, the sails almost touching the water. I thought we were going to tip all the way over. I pushed back further than I thought possible. The water came up the deck near the edge of the cockpit opening, only two inches away from rushing in. I didn't know what to think. It seemed like we poised in that precarious position for a long time, the boat not sure whether to go ahead and tip the rest of the way over or settle back and straighten up. Finally, it decided on level. 
I realized then why the cockpit was so small. Had it been a little larger, the water might have poured in and we might have sunk. Jimmy handled the boat expertly. He didn't seem concerned, which was reassuring. We were immediately back upright and still sailing, and there was lots more to do other than worry about what had nearly happened. Jimmy called, ready about, and with that and an undertone to me, we'll shift to the other side, then to both of us. Hard lee. His commands meant nothing, and I had no idea what to expect. But things started happening real fast. Jimmy turned the boat, headed a new direction. The sails began to flap. All three of us stood in the cockpit briefly, the sails shaking widely just over our heads. As we shifted to the opposite side, George pulled on the line attached to the small sail up front and tightened it. All I had to do was move across the boat and keep out of the way. We were now headed in a new direction. The sails were on the opposite side of the boat, no longer flapping, and the boat leaned the other way and again surged ahead. After it was over, I realized it was really a very orderly maneuver, despite the seeming chaos for a few seconds. As we neared the shore, Jimmy again said, ready about. This time I knew what to expect and got ready to change sides. After several such changes, we had worked our way up the bay, angling back and forth across it. Jimmy was satisfied with what he had learned and said, I think we can race. He turned the boat back toward the dock, letting out the big sail as he did. The boat sailed level, and we didn't need to lean to keep it from tipping. We sailed straight toward the dock and made it back in no time. The other crews had watched how we sailed and concluded the wind was good for racing. They were preparing their boats, and by the time we arrived, the water around the dock was crowded with boats, all with loud, flapping sails. When Jimmy asked, you want to race with us? I didn't hesitate. I answered with a, with a quick, you bet. In a few minutes, we were back sailing. Only this time, there were a dozen other boats around us, all on the move and all very close. I thought several times we were going to collide. But the boats turned at the last moment under complete control. It felt like a graceful dance of big white herons, and I was on board one of them and dancing. I paid close attention trying to figure out how the sails worked and how they used the wind to power them. My eyes and brain were in overload, trying to process so much information that was coming in so fast. I was also trying to learn a new language, the language of sailing. The sails are called jib and mainsail. The lines that control the sails were called sheets. Jimmy steered with a tiller attached to a rudder, the board at the back that poked down in the water. We had a large steel thing that stuck down in the middle of the boat and had to be raised and lowered, called a dagger board. Jimmy was the skipper, which meant he was in charge and steered the boat. Ready, meant, ready about meant the skipper was about to do something called tack, and we would make a sharp turn. Hard lee meant he was actually doing it. George was the crew, and my job, well, it didn't have a name, at least none that I recognized. And there were many, many more terms that I couldn't remember or hadn't figured out yet. When I got home, there was so much to tell, my mouth couldn't keep up. The words exploded out in bunches like machine gun bursts. Mother and Daddy were amused by my excitement as they tried to piece together what exactly had happened. Where, where were you? Who is Jimmy? How big are these boats? How long did you sail? I didn't have time to answer all their questions. I was too busy trying to tell them everything that had happened, and words just kept pouring out in happy, confused clustered. They just had to keep up as best they could. That was the beginning of a lifelong apprenticeship in sailing, which I have just enjoyed recently in uh, going with uh, going to the internationals, the National Sailing Hall of Fame, to induct Clarkie Mills, the designer of the Optimus Pram, which I later was involved with, and to induct him into the Hall of Fame and met with sailors from certainly the noted sailors from the America's Cup and from the uh, Olympics and from around the world. It was a very exciting weekend and a very, and a very happy one. The, um, 
trying to think, what else would you, what would you like to know about Clearwater Beach from that time period? Do you, do you know, how many people know what a, has seen a sand sparrow on Clearwater Beach? How many people have seen a sand sparrow on Clearwater Beach? You don't need to know what they are. You have, okay, one. Oh, we have some. tornado? No, no, no. It's a little prickly thing. It looks like a very small man, landmine about the size of my fingernail. And if you, if you don't know what they are, you haven't run into them. <laughs> Ann and I were trying to find some the other day and we searched and we finally found one that had escaped the lawnmower in somebody's lawn. But in that time, sand spurs were the bane of our existence. They're still here. Yeah. They're still here. Well, back, back in the 40s, they were all over everywhere. We had this lovely empty field, wonderful for playing baseball, except for the sand spurs and they come in clusters and they hang out over a path and if the path has gotten packed down when they drop when they are first there they're they're a little bit flexible but when they harden in the sun they're like a spike that comes in it'll puncture a, a bicycle tire and it stays on your foot and you try and hop through them you know and they catch in your foot and you're balancing on one foot trying to take them out and you fall over on the other sand spurs are one of the things that i'm glad have left clearwater beach they're but still here. they're still here but not nearly as not nearly as as many as we as we had then we were here during um we, I first moved here in 43 during World War II. So we had all of the military. Most of the houses on the beach were summer cottages that belonged to people in Clearwater. And so housing was a real issue. As a matter of fact, it was because we couldn't find any housing in Macon that we wound up coming to Clearwater. But we got here and we rented one of these summer cottages and they were, uh, they were very comfortable, very small, and we enjoyed it thoroughly, and best thing was you could look down the street and there was the Gulf. Uh, and we, I ran, I remember the first morning we got here, and I, the first thing when I remembered where I was, was to take off and run down to the beach. But it was a real shock. It was a shock because I was expecting an Atlantic beach. I'd visited on St. Simons, and in St. Simons you have the, the waves that come up and break up on the shore and run up several feet depending on how high the waves were. I got to Clearwater Beach, and they had these little tiny waves about six inches that weren't even sure they were really waves, and they would sort of fall over a little bit and, and run maybe a foot or two, three feet. And I thought I'd been cheated that because the beach wasn't like I was expected, but I got to appreciate it and, and learn. And it, it's a lot easier to swim on the, in the Gulf water than it is into the Atlantic because even on a calm day in the Atlantic, you're getting a, a mouthful of water uh, every, few, every few seconds. There was one day, yeah, excuse me. What was the population when you moved here? Of the, of the beach, probably a couple of hundred may, maybe, but maybe, maybe a few more than that, but most of them were military. Was your uh, father military? Yes, yes, he was in the Air Corps. And he uh, got transferred here? Right, he was transferred to Drew Field. It was interesting, we spent the summer with him in Oklahoma City, and he was expecting to go overseas. As a midpoint, he was transferred back to Drew Field. So we went back to Macon, and all of the military bases had come in to Macon at that time and had gobbled up all the housing, and we literally could not find any place. And Dad says, come on down here. I'll, I'll see if I can find you a place on Clearwater Beach. And there were, there were a lot of military that had, had found this wonderful little jewel in coming across from Tampa, especially there seemed to be a lot of dentists from the dental unit at the there so we came over here and dad was immediately transferred to charlotte so he wasn't here with us much and went on on over to europe um into Fran england and france um, so we were here we were here by ourselves for a year and a half two years until he 
until he came back. But we had all of the all of the planes during their training runs. Um, we had P-47s, we had B-17s that would come out over the Gulf and do training runs. And they would come in and on uh, Sand Key, and they'd come in and do dive bombing. Uh, they would tow a, tar a target behind them, and the other planes would practice, practice shooting at it. And we found all sorts of stuff washed up on the beach. Uh, we found a silk parachute one time. That, that kept us busy for a couple of weeks. But I, th I guess the, the most interesting thing we found, there was um, the fuel tank, you know, the wing fuel tank that they fastened on and then they would jetson and drop off. One of those washed up on the beach. We didn't know what it was because all we saw was about a cone about oh, two, and a half, two feet high sitting up above the waves. Well, we went out to it and we, it was floating obviously, but it wasn't floating, the bottom of it was sitting on the, on the, on the sand. So we had to work it ashore, and what we were going to do, I mean, it was a wonderful treasure for a 10, 11 year old, and we tried to figure out what we were going to do with it, but we finally figured out to cut out the place where it attached, and we were going to make a kayak, you know, and obviously this was rough metal, so we had to get some garden hose and put around the inside of it, but it had absolutely no stability. There was nothing that would keep it upright, and we never did figure out how to keep, how to stay level in it, or, or to stay in it. But again, that that took us that took us a while and, and occupied us. Uh, one of the we also had jetties. Do you remember the jetty? Have you seen pictures? These were built by the CCC uh, during the Depression, and they would hold the hold the sand. It's interesting with the jetties holding the sand, the beach came right up to the current day bulkheads. Now it's way out. <laughs> we were talking the other day about how much, how much wider the beach is than it was those days. But they had these jetties down. They were every uh, 50, feet, 50 feet apart. And so it was great for races. You could mark off the distance for the races. There was one day, but, but they were interesting to jump. You know, you, when you come to a jetty, you don't just step over it. You got to, as a boy, you've got to jump over it. Well, the problem is they changed constantly. And you could get a little storm in coming from one direction and it built up on one side of the jetty. And then the wind changed for a couple of days and that was eroded away and you built up on the other side of the jetty. So when you went to take off, you had no idea whether you were jumping up or you were jumping down. And it got to be quite a challenge. One day I misjudged and trying to make a calculation in the air, I hit smack cadaver across the top of my instep and broke some bones in there or, or something anyway. And it was about four or five blocks down the beach from home. So there I was, I, I, there was no way I could put any weight on that foot. So I got in the water and pulled myself in the shallow water back up, back up to opposite the house. And I got there and now I had to, had to put weight on it or I had to get home some way. And happily one of my, one of my friends came back. So I elected him as a crutch and leaned on, leaned on him and hopped on the other foot until I, until I got home. But um, we played, we also found, any walk down the beach any morning was good for a treasure hunt. I mean, there were, there were clothing, there was military, there were uh, shells uh, from the 50 caliber machine guns. Uh, there were just all sorts of interesting shells, meaning the machine gun shells, excuse me. I realized I needed to, correct that. There were also shells. <laughs> there were also shells. And we had, we had a lot of fun collecting those. Um, grandmother took to making shell jewelry out of the coquinas. Are there any coquinas on the beach at this, at this time? Little tiny, little tiny uh, bivalves. And they just, they come up in the surf. At that point, you could dig up a handful and pick out the colors you want. And she would specify, um, I want you to get me some, some purple ones. I'm making a, a brooch, I need some larger purple shells. So she'd put in her order and I would get the shells. We played on the beach. We made all sorts of games, games in the water. Um, it was really an idyllic existence. 
I was reading a book the other day about children. It's a syndrome I had never heard of, but it's a nature deficit syndrome. And I had anything but a nature deficit syndrome, and I felt very blessed to it. I have had marine biology uh, in the bay. We, we shifted over to the bay and played with the boat in the bay, ran a trot line across right out here, right across the, the opening into the cove to the yacht club. I worked with the guys at the yacht club. They took me under their, under their wing. Uh, I remember one day we pushed Mr. Hunt's boat. Jackson said, would you help me take it over to the marine ways? He says, we've got to clean off a little. The growth had built up on the bottom of it. Well, he went to start the propeller and it wouldn't turn. It was so encrusted with, with marine growth and barnacles. So I said, what are we going to do? He says, well, let's push it across the basin and we'll get in the water and, and clean it off. Well, we pushed it as far as we could and it coasted about two thirds of the way across this. What, what's the name of these? It used to be yacht basin apartments. The Bell Harbor. Bell Harbor. We pushed it to about half. There was a, a sand beach over there at that point. And I, I, he said, what are we going to do now? I said, well, give me a rope and I'll jump in the water and p get onto the shore and pull it on over. So that's what we did. We spent an hour and a half. My hands were a bloody mess trying to cre clean off the bottom of the boat so we could get it to where we could get it underway to get it over to the marine waves, ways to clean it off. I also was the designated diver at the yacht club. You know, they, people would drop tools, they would drop uh, eyeglasses, they would drop keys. Uh, one lady dropped a diamond ring and she was just aghast. Um, and uh, she says to a friend of mine, it, this happened to be someone else, Monty, and uh, she said, oh, oh, would you get, I'll give you $20. Well, he dove in and it was a sand bottom and he found it the first dive. And uh, she said, oh, I didn't have any idea it would be that easy. I'll only give you $10. <laughs> so he says, okay, you go get it. And he flipped it back in the water, <laughs> knowing, knowing that it would be reasonably easy to find. But um, another, another time at the yacht club, one of the uh, captains of the, of the boat um, forgot to turn on his blower. So the gasoline fumes built up. And when he started the motor, uh, the top of the cabin came off and he came off right behind it. Happily, he was thrown toward the water rather than toward the dock and was not injured. But um, it gave a wonderful uh, boon to us divers because we were gathering boat parts. The boat burned to the waterline uh, and we were gathering boat parts for a couple of months of, of that and they were there was a market for them so we made our spending money we made our spending money doing that um, yeah can you tell me uh, what was the worst hurricane and what was it like here they welcomed us to Clearwater very generously and very quickly it was the second or third week after we arrived in the fall that as going over to going over to school on the school bus, I noticed the, the the wind patterns. I've always been sort of attentive to that. Were different that morning. I looked out in the Gulf, and the waves instead of coming in toward the shore were sort of running parallel to the shore. Um, and we got to we got to downtown Clearwater, where the the flagpole, the city flagpole, and was there for a reason. And one of the one of the other kids on the bus who'd been here for several years, she says, "Oh, those are hurricane flags flying. Anybody know what a hurricane flag looks like? Red square, black middle, two of them, one above above each other. Uh, that's a hurricane flag. That was the notification. We didn't have the Weather Channel telling us two weeks in advance of that." A uh, computer models predicting exactly where it was going to go but said oh there's a hurricane coming well we got to school and before mid-morning we were dismissed and sent home and we got back to the beach and by that time an evacuation order had been issued 
And so we turned right around and went back to the Fort Harrison Hotel, which was then a big resort hotel. And so we spent the first hurricane here in the Fort Harrison. As best I can tell, they, they, didn't, have, they didn't have the data to report a hurricane at that point. And the information about a hurricane was primarily gathered from land bases where they could measure wind and wave action and ships at sea that got caught in it and they would send in their reports. And so it was not easy to track. The hurricane did not have a direct hit here. The wind was in the, was probably high tropical storm or category one hurricane. And to my knowledge, there hadn't been a lot of hurricanes hit Clearwater. Clearwater is the highest bluff over by Haven Street, right there just to the right of where the bridge comes in. That's the highest bluff on the west coast of Florida and one of the, and one of the safest spots from storm surge. But I don't remember any real serious hurricanes that have, that have hit here more recently in the last three or four years, I think probably. Um, so we, as I say, we, and our first one was more fun because we were running up. They didn't have the power on. There were no elevators in the hotel. And so mother and grandmother were happy to be in their room. And Ann and Mary and I, we took to the stairwells and we ran up to the ballroom on the top floor and looked out over the gulf. And one of the boys trying to get Ann's attention said, look, there's a house floating out there. And everybody turned and looked for the house. But there wasn't any house floating out there. And finally, he admitted it after a while. But the kids, we had a, we had a good time. And we were there about a day and a half. Um, and played tag and hide and go seek in the in the uh, stair stairwells, mostly mostly going going in and out. It was sort of neat to be in a resort hotel, even though it was closed down, and the the desk clerk at the hotel was obviously not pleased to be there, um, but he he tolerated us at least as well as as well as could be. There was electricity on the beach. I don't know whether it survived the hurricane. I, do, I don't remember the, I don't remember that it was off for, for a long time. Were there any commercial buildings like a grocery store? Or there was, there was, there was a small grocery store. The Pelican restaurant was here. Pelican what? The Pelican restaurant was here also? Oh yeah. Yeah, there was a, and there was a liquor store down on the corner of where the causeway, where Highway 60 comes in, and to Mandalay Avenue. There was a trailer park. There was a trailer park. Uh, there were the Palm Pavilions, uh, Palm Pavilion, and, and Everingham, Everingham Pavilion was there. The fire station and the big water tower were there. The Clearwater Yacht Club was right across the street from the fire station, with a big uh, parking lot out out front there. Um, what other, there was, there was Max, there was Max, Max Sundry. Sundry, Sundry's, I'd forgotten the name that he used. Mac was a character, he was, he was on vaudeville, and he loved to, to play vaudeville, and he had a preference for us kids, which was neat. He could, he could sell things to us that he wouldn't sell to the adults, like a candy bar. They were a bit scarce at that time, and you ask him if he came, also he was very gruff, he pretended to be. He pretended to be gruff. There was a, there was a jitney bus that went from town every hour back and forth to beach and to town. And the driver of the bus also he tried to be in charge, you know, but he wasn't. And but he was he was really nice. We got to got to know him. If you went to a movie over town and you missed the last bus, which left town at eleven o'clock, you were in trouble because you were walking the causeway. And some of my sister's dates, who had them a date for the movie and missed the last bus, had not only had to walk them home, but then turn around and walk back. Um, the other thing we did was in playing, in playing, of course, you, we played war. That's the thing you do. Finger works is a good, well, it can be a machine gun or a pistol or a rifle, whatever. Uh, very versatile. But we dug trenches in the vacant lots here. 
and put boards over the top of them and piled sand on them. Boards over the top, sand, sand comes down through, you have sand all in your eyes and, and such. One of my schoolmates came up to me, just furious. Your sister's boyfriend almost killed us the other day. And I was trying to involve, I, my sister's boyfriend tried to kill you, and how am I involved with this, you know, and such. Well, it turned out that uh, Ann had been riding with Buddy, Buddy, we'll not implicate the guilty by giving you his last name, but she was riding with Buddy and they got a little bored with riding down the street, so they took out across the, um, across the vacant lot and they came within a foot of hitting one of these trenches that we had dug and Cyril had been down in the in there and it really he had a he had a good point and so when we explained this to mother we no longer Ann and Buddy no longer went cross country and I no longer and my friends no longer played in the trenches we had to find other places uh, to play and there were plenty of them plenty of them to do uh, to do that the, the building that was on this site, the Old Fish House, is what it was named. It was built by the uh, CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, during the war as a project so that Clearwater could do um, process fish. They just forgot one thing, and that is to check the controlling depth of the water coming in the passes. And it wasn't deep enough for the um, fishing boats to get in, to bring their fish in so they could be processed. So it never had a fish. Well, it did have a fish. I took a mullet out of it, out of a, one of the snipes that was in the, in the shed one day. But it never had, never processed any fish. It was an old tin building made with, made with uh, probably undried uh, timbers, which then, as they dried out, were fire. Uh, burned very very easily they had um, one end of it was used by the yacht club and by Clarkie Mills who designed the Optimus Pram he built a boat there and I first met him working in the corner of the of the fish house and the other boats from the yacht club were stored in there the prams, prams were stored in there also at, at, a, at a later point in, in their days and the north end of it was used by the um, by the Sea Scouts and by the um, ah, shocks. what's the civilian people that helped the Coast Guard Auxiliary and they had just installed some electric new electronic equipment and evidently did not uh, they overused the capacity of the lines and power coming in and one night it caught fire and it burned up everything in sight there was no once it got started, there was no way. I remember Dad waking me up at, I had just gone to bed, it was about midnight on 12.30 or so, and he said, your boat's burning, the fish house is on fire. And I grabbed a jacket and put it on and we were out the door and came down here. And we were pulling, the snipe shed was just about 40 feet that way from this building. And there were some of the snipes in there and some in the fish house. So we were pulling, my pram was in the, in the fish house. So we pulled the snipes away from, from the shed. There were docks out here and we went out there and we just took the boats and t untied the lines and pushed them out in the bay to get them away from the fire. The fire department was here and uh, they just controlled it, trying to keep it from going. There was a big grove of Australian pines from here, Baymont Street, all this side of Baymont Street, all the way to the um, to Mandalay, were a, a huge grove of Australian pines. They didn't want those to catch on fire, so they controlled it, and it burned. It burned down. It burned out the entire fleet of Optimus Prams. The um, the Optimus Prams were sponsored. Let me go back and tell the whole story of the prams. That, that needs to get, get out here. Uh, Dad saw the fun I had sailing. And he, he said, you know, every boy ought to have that opportunity. He said, what we need 
is a little boat that we can, that every boy can have. The merchants can sponsor it. They've just done the soapbox derby where the merchants sponsor the boat, the boys and the dads build them. So he said, let's let the merchants, let's get a little boat that they can race and the merchants will sponsor it. And so he proposed this to the Optimist Club and the Optimist says, yeah, that's good. He said, talk to, follow up on this. So dad talked to Clarky Mills and um, Clarkie in about two weeks came up with this amazing little boat and uh, the merchants sponsored it and they put their name on, name on the boat and when the son reported, reported the races it wasn't, you know, Cliff McKay Jr. It was the WTAN boat or it was the Clearwater Sun boat or it was, uh, you know, Florida Power boat that, that won the races which was sort of fun. But um, all of the boats, the entire fleet, except one or two that had been home that, the boys had taken home that night, burned up in that fire. And they went on the radio, Hartley, Ron Hartley, Howard Hartley, the, um, the news commentator went on WTAN and made a plea for these to replace these boats. And they replaced the 28 that burned with 43. Uh, and I think five thousand dollars to help rebuild a building or a shed or shed for them, and that was became the youth center, which was remodeled or or became this place uh, in in this same same location. But that was a very uh, dramatic support by the uh, by the city and by the merchants in particular. The little boat that Clark Mills designed. 70 years ago, over 400,000 of them have been built. They are raced in 120 countries in six continents. They are, it's the largest one design class in the world. Virtually all Olympic sailors have trained in this little boat. And when I say 400,000 boats, the, the, boys, the, the boys and girls that have sailed these number in the millions because the multiple sail. And so, do any of you sail with the wind lassies? No. no. Prams. Prams. Oh, okay. But, um, but that was, a, that was a, a wonderful story. And Clarky was, I just was referenced, was uh, inducted into the National Sailing Hall of Fame. Um, I did do, I met the international head, the international executive secretary of the PRAM, the International PRAM organization, and um, he was preparing a 60 year history, this was 10 years ago, and he asked me to do a, a, a supplement on the origin of the PRAMs, and I've got a couple of, of those books here uh, as well. Yeah. What? I was up in Maine three years ago. Yeah. And there was a pram sitting there. And I said, huh, <laughs> <laughs> their water beach. I said, I know. Maze, you know. Maze did this all. I mean, it was right there in the middle of the, of the festival. <laughs> I can't tell you, we've had the opportunity to travel a lot. And I can't tell you the number of places where we've seen prams. The, the whole skyline of Biscayne Bay was blotted white by 400 prams out there in a regatta. We've seen them um, Madeira, on the Madeira Islands. We've seen them in Europe. We've seen them in Scandinavia. Uh, we coached a little girl who was a little bit upset and a little bit over her head at the moment. And she was by our boat when it was anchored in Nantucket. And uh, so we encouraged her and her, her coach finally came over after a few minutes and, and uh, it's, talked her in so she could do it. And she got back, she sailed it back herself. Uh, so, but it's a, it's a magnificent program. Um, and I it, it was really so thrilled when you could say, oh, we know yep. the person that invented this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. My father was stationed at uh, Fairfield, 
Yep. At that time, in the 40s. Yeah. How was it with, he used to come to Clearwater Beach and his buddies every minute they could. So, I would just always imagine there was a lot of Air Force people on the beach. Did you interact with them? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, I was raised well in Macon before we moved here. We entertained soldiers that came to our church. We would invite them home for dinner. Here we had whole bomber crews, all 11 of them, into, into, our, house, into our house for dinner. And everyone, I don't remember, I don't remember a Sunday when we were, we would go to church and there would be soldiers there. It, they were Army Air Force, so the Air Corps, Airmen, whatever. Um, and they would come and, and spend the afternoon. And there were, there, were lots of, there were lots of airmen on the beach. And there were a number of the officers that lived here. Uh, just about everybody, I think there was one lady on our street that was not military related. We rented the cottage from a lady around the corner, and she was not military related. But just about everybody on our street was was related to the were military. I remember mother was um, there was an accident on Mandalay. Um, a boy on a bicycle had been hit by a car, and there was a group gathered around. It was it coming home time, five o'clock? There was a group gathered around. And mother looked over, and the, the officer that was helping the boy had wings on, and she knew a lot of the dentists, because our street seemed to be full of dentists. And she says, why don't some of you medical men go out there and help that boy? And they just nodded and didn't say anything. It was a flight surgeon that was working, that was working with him. But uh, it, yeah, every weekend, every weekend we were, they had, they had, it was a, it was a great break and an opportunity uh, for them. They'd rent a bicycle, ride up and down, uh, head back to Drew Field. Your dad came over here then? Yeah, he was a radio operator on the B-17, so he was stationed here for quite a few months. Yeah. And then different places in the country. You're right. I moved here 20 some years ago. He came down quite a few times. Oh, how neat. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. We, of course, mother and dad and my sisters have lived in Clearwater, and I've, I have never lived here since I went, to, went away to college. I've been back frequently. There was one time we'd been away about, about 18 months. I usually made it back every year, but at one time we'd it'd been a little bit longer, and they had done something silly down here at the main intersection, and I couldn't find my way onto the beach. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. No political comments. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I believe you grew up across the street. Weren't you on that corner of Somerset and Mandalay? Yes. Well, I'm right across the street. I grew up, was born there. And he was talking about the military. My grandfather bought that property that I'm on in 1942. And he was staying, they were staying at Euler's. Remember where he yeah. was? Well, yeah. They were staying with Mr. and Mrs. Euler. Yeah. And he bought it in 42 from the photos, right? His photos? Because Mr. Spoto had built it as a retirement area, uh, think an income for his family, and he was afraid when the war came that he would not have, you know, the tenants, and he was scared to death, so he sold it to my grandfather. And my grandfather was full during the whole war with all the officers from Drew Field, because if you know or are familiar with Mac McDill, McDill was not in existence then. There was a small airfield called Drew Field. That's yeah. about, isn't that about where Camp Airport is now? Yeah. Where mm -hmm. Drew Field was. Yeah, approximately. So Yeah, it was a it was a real boon to the local uh, economy because most of these were summer homes and people would move back. Some of some of the kids that were in school with me and that we played with on the beach lived here for the summer and went back over town, back over town for the winter. Yeah, it was an it was an interesting and a fun time and the beach was. I don't think I'm being just nostalgic when I say. But it was a lot nicer than. Well, then. One day road, Absolutely. Yep. Sand and marl. And Sandsburg. 
and sand spurs. <laughs> I, was the South End in existence then? Oh yeah. Well, it was the first finger. I believe there were there were houses on the first. You know, the South End has five fingers going out, uh, like a hand. And the first finger, there were houses on the first finger. Two or three, at least down at the end. I'm sure those were built by that time. I don't think there was anything on the second. The third and fourth and fifth, I know, were just sand. And there was no trees. They had pumped them up. And it was, it was just sand down there. Do you know when Carlowell started? Carlowell was, oh yeah, it was earlier. Carlowell was in place. It was in place. Mm -hmm. There were homes out there. Yeah. Yeah. By the time I was there, there, there were gates, but there was there was no guard in the gate. I remember a guard there as late as seventy. Well, maybe that's why why we oh, snuck up okay. snuck up the beach. I'm sure. And you did. I mean, the beach was open, and and still is technically at least. But you can go, you, we could walk up, we could walk up the beach. Clearwater Pass was open at that point. There was, it has since filled in, but it was, uh, you would have a swim. Yeah. Did you swim to Kalanese, or what was the only? Um, the, the current was a little, we usually went over in boats. The current was a little, was a little uh, swift for going swimming across there we never did, never needed to never did yeah you were talking about the fingers of the south end were they there naturally and then they just built seawalls and that ball was built that was pumped up and the same on island estates also um so, i'm not sure about island estates there were spoil islands on island estates, there there were mangrove islands, so there was a base, but I'm sure they were manipulated. I don't. There was no reason why they should follow the contours of what nature had put there. Uh, but we 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 sailed over there on on the prams and took picnic lunches and such. Zip. There was no bridge. That was built in, come on, Clearwater Beach historian, when was the Sand Key Bridge built? Way back there. Across the Sand Key? No. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. There was a wooden, there was a wooden bridge that came where the Memorial Bridge connects over town and came into Baymont Street right here. That's the wood. There was not a wooden bridge across across the pass yeah, to Sand Key. Over Sandy, no, 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 no. Go over Island Estates. It went, it went to Clearwater. Oh, yeah, right. It went to Clearwater over. It went right back there. There wasn't one to Sandy. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah. I I have the impression it was built mid to late fifties. I was not here at that time, but that's that's the recollection. But it wasn't wooden. No, the first bridge, it's pretty much as it is right now. No, it had a, it had a drawbridge. It, it a, did, you're right. It had a drawbridge. You're right. In the mid-60s, no, it was a little bit later, about the 70s, because when I was in college, it yeah. had a toll, 25 cents. Right. And it had, it had, it had, just on our website, they have, somebody had a token over the old Sand Key Bridge. We had tokens. You could buy those from the city if you lived on the street. And yeah. then they abolished it because the right. folks, they were having to always raise the lower and so it being stopped. So they did just so 
like this one. That was originally, the one here was originally drawbridge. Yep. And then they made it there. Yep. Well, that was a lot later. Yeah. yeah. That was a drawbridge. We sailed, we sailed up to the drawbridge. We were circumnavigating the, the causeway. We sailed up to the drawbridge in our prams. And of course, we didn't need them to open for our prams, you know, but we were sailing there and all of a sudden the bridge tender opened the bridge. <laughs> and we just sort of sailed proudly <laughs> under, <laughs> knowing, knowing we didn't, we could actually take snipes under this bridge. What you do is you sheet, pull the sails in tight and then you lay it over on its side and it floats on its deck and you hold the mast and just walk it with your feet on dry land and walk it under the bridge, get to the other side side and right, put it back up right. But, uh, but we sailed and they opened the drawbridge for us one day. We laughed. I laughed about that. And we came in the, we came in the um, Clearwater Pass, the Dan's, Dan's Island Bridge. One day we came in there at night where our boat had been disabled and the Coast Guard towed us in through the bridge at night. And the Coast Guard said, open the bridge. And they said, yes, sir. <laughs> and we came in. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be, to be with you and to celebrate Clearwater Beach. Thank you.